So our study of groups in abstract algebra up until this point has been largely anatomical. What do groups look like? Uh, what kinds of pieces exist inside of groups and what do they look like? What do elements inside a group look like? What is their structure in and of themselves? But if we really want to get to where we're going this semester and where we're trying to go is we're trying to be able to classify what are all possible finite groups of a given order. That's kind of too big of a, a stretch for one semester, so we're also going to add the word abelian in there. What are all possible finite abelian groups? What do they look like? What is their structure? To get there, we're going to need more than just anatomy. We're going to need some physiology as well. Not just what do the parts of a group and the elements of a group look like, but how do they function and how do they interact with one another to give the larger group its structure. So the story of our remaining chapters this semester is going to be a story of figuring out, first of all, how do we take some smaller pieces inside a group and use those pieces to build up the larger group. That's what we'll begin to talk about in these videos in the construction of a direct product. But the question after that is then, if I have a bigger group, how can I find out some smaller constituent parts that I can use to take that group apart and discover that substructure? That's going to be the topic of factor groups and quotient groups that we'll talk about in the next chapter. And then finally, how does all of that, knowing how to put groups together and how to take them back apart, how does that then tell us what are all the possible structures for finite abelian groups? So in this set of videos, what I want to do is start by asking the question, what is it really that makes the group Z6, which is cyclic, and the group S3, the symmetry group on three symbols, what is it that makes those two groups different? In particular, how are each of these two groups built out of their subgroups? And I chose this example because, first of all, these two groups have the same order. They both have six elements in them. And also, inside of each of them, we can identify two very similar subgroups. So, for example, in Z6, if I sort of list the six elements like this, in S3, if I list the six elements like that, then what I can actually do is identify a subgroup of order 3 inside each of these two groups. In here, it's the cyclic group generated by 2, so 0, 2, and 4. In S3, it's the cyclic group generated by the 3 cycle, 1, 2, 3. Those are groups of subgroups of order 3. Each also has a subgroup of order 2, so in Z mod 6, that would be the subgroup generated by 3. Um, in S3, an example, is the subgroup generated by the transposition 1, 2. So both of these groups have six elements, and they both have this subgroup of order 3 that I can identify, this subgroup of order 2 that I can identify. So what is it, given all that data about these two groups, what is it really that makes Z6 and S3 so different as far as the way in which these building blocks, and these building blocks are isomorphic. This H is isomorphic to that H. This K is isomorphic to that K. So it must be something about the way in which those subgroups interact with one another and interact with the rest of the group that ultimately makes Z6 different, not isomorphic, to S3. So those are the kinds of questions we'd like to be able to answer in this set of videos. For example, one of the things that we'll notice is that Z6, the cyclic group of order 6, has generators, 1 and 5, that I can actually obtain by adding together an element of H with an element of K. For example, how do I get 1? I can add together the 4 that I have from the subgroup H from the 3 that I have from the subgroup K. 4 plus 3, taken mod 6, that's equal to 1. So I can actually make a generator by combining together using the operation of the group an element from H and an element from K. But evidently, we can't necessarily do the same thing over here. Um, and the reason we can't do it over here is that S3 is not a cyclic group. If I tried to combine together an element of H and an element of K, I'm going to get another element, another interesting element, but I know for sure that that element is not going to generate S3. Why? Well, because S3 is not abelian, therefore there's no way it could have been cyclic. So there is some fundamental differences in how these groups are put together. And our first step along the line is going to be to define a construction that lets us take some smaller groups and piece them together into form a larger group called the external direct product. So if you hand me Z mod 3 and a Z mod 2, for example, and that's up to isomorphism what these two subgroups look like, how can I take that Z mod 3 and that Z mod 2 and sort of smush them together to make a larger group that has each one of those as a subgroup? The next thing we can do is we can look at the orders of elements uh, inside of these two examples. So in my Z mod 3 subgroup, I know that my orders of elements are 1, 3, and 3. In my Z mod 2 subgroup, the orders are going to be 1 and 2. 
And it turned out that when I added together this 4 and this 3 in Z mod 6, element of order 3, element of order 2, I combined them together with the operation of this group, what ended up happening was I made an element of order 6. And because my group has 6 elements, any element of order 6 is going to generate the whole group. So what can we say about the orders of elements in one of these product groups? How is the order of all the elements in my product group related to the orders of the elements that were used to make that group? But clearly the story is different in Zmod 6 than it is in Zmod or in S3 in the example over here on the right. So in the example on the left, I took two cyclic groups, a Zmod 3, so a cyclic subgroup generated by 2 and a cyclic subgroup generated by 3. And when I combined them together to form this group of order 6, this whole group of order 6 turned out to be cyclic. But that wasn't the case over here for S3. So in what circumstances is a product of cyclic groups going to be a cyclic group? And then finally, the last thing we're going to be able to do in this week's videos is we're going to be able to unmask the multiplicative groups as well, the groups UN. So we're going to have enough tools uh, in this video to be able to classify the structure of any one of these multiplicative groups UN. It's a finite group. It's an abelian group. Remember, this is the group of multiplicative units modulo n. And we're going to be able to, at the culmination of this week's videos, classify what do all of the UNs look like? How are they related by isomorphism to the additive cyclic groups, Zn? So we're going to have a lot of tools for putting together smaller groups into larger groups in this set of videos to really help us understand how to build from simpler structures toward more complex structures.